Operational science, the kind of testable, repeatable science we use in the present that puts people on the moon and makes your computers work and so on, is, is require, requires this crucial presupposition that there is uniformity. Because if you think about it, science studies predictability, doesn't it? I do an experiment under certain conditions on Monday. If I do the same experiment on Tuesday under sufficiently similar conditions, I expect to get the same result, right? If I didn't, I wouldn't assume that nature is uniform. I'd assume something changed in my experiment. I would assume the conditions are different because that it's, it's very profoundly built into us to know that nature is uniform. God hardwired that into us because he knew we would need it. All technology is based on this crucial presupposition. You realize that? Your car wouldn't work if the laws of physics and chemistry just changed tomorrow morning, right? You get to start your car and it just, poof, it turns into a big mushroom. You'd say, well, that's a little odd, but hey, it's a random chance universe for you, right? <laughs> the laws of nature are consistent over time and space. And so we say the future is similar to the past in this respect. The future reflects the past is one way of putting it. And you know that. When you woke up this morning, did you brace yourself just in case gravity should send you hurtling toward the ceiling? No, you, you presupposed that gravity would work as it has in the past. When you walked into this room, did you hold your breath just in case all the air should go into that corner for a few minutes? You presuppose that air would spread out as it has in the past. You presuppose that the laws of nature will be in the future as they have been in the past. And of course, the consistent Christian has every reason to believe that because God upholds the universe in a consistent way for our benefit. Now, there's something I, I do have to make a little caveat here because, of course, God doesn't have to. I would say laws of logic, there are no exceptions to that because it's based on God's nature and he doesn't change. Uniformity is a little different though because God is under no requirement to uphold the universe in a consistent way and he doesn't have to. But he does so normally for our benefit. God can do what we might call a supernatural miracle. He can do something that goes above and beyond the laws of nature. And that's fine, it's not a problem for the biblical God. Nonetheless, God upholds the universe in a uniform law-like fashion most of the time. And he does that for our benefit. In fact, God has promised us a certain degree of uniformity in nature. He does that back in Genesis 8, 22. Well, the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. Here God is promising us that the cycles of nature, the seasons, the day and night cycle, for example, will continue in the future as they have been in the past. That's a promise from God. As long as the earth remains, so until judgment day, we can count on the fact that the future will be like the past. God has promised us that. And you might think, well, that's hardly profound. Everybody knows that the future is like the past. But you see, it's because everybody knows it that's so profound. Because apart from the biblical God, we'd have no reason to believe this. No reason whatsoever. It's only because of God's faithfulness that we can presume that the future would be like the past. You see, an evolutionist has no basis uh, for the uniformity of nature. He must assume it in practice, but he doesn't have any basis for it in principle. And yet, every step you take presupposes the uniformity of nature. An analogy that Dr. Bonson uh, once used is that, you know, when you stub your toe, you get up in the middle of the night to get a drink of water, and you stub your toe on something because it's dark and you're fumbling around, you stub your toe, oh, that hurts. Now, the next night when you get up to get a drink of water, you're very careful not to stub your toe again, right? You're going to say, well, this time I'm going to take it extra slow. This time I'm going to turn the lights on. Why? Because you assume that if you stub your toe again, it will hurt again, right? You take that for granted. Well, of course it will. But you see, that makes sense in a Christian worldview. God upholds the universe in a consistent fashion. He's promised us that he will. Yeah, if you stub your toe again, it'll hurt again. But in a random chance universe, why would that be? In a random chance universe, maybe the next time I stub my toe, it'll be the most pleasurable experience of a lifetime, right? I should look forward to that maybe. Or maybe every third time I stub my toe. Who knows? You can't say. No, we take it for granted that the future will be in certain respects like the past. You can't live apart from that principle, but... Only the Bible can account for that principle. Only the biblical God. And let's just think about this a little bit. We can't know the future because of the way our brains are wired. We can remember the past, and even there I'm being very generous because I'm granting that your memory is basically reliable, which is also a Christian presupposition. But let's just say for the sake of argument, we can remember the past, so we know that. We experience the present. Of course, even there I'm being generous because you were presuming that your senses are reliable. But we can't know the future because there's a barrier right here, isn't there? We can't know that. How could we possibly know anything about a future that none of us have experienced? It seems to me there's only one way that that could be possible, and that is by the knowledge of God, who is beyond time, who knows the future. He, de he declares the end from the beginning, from ancient times, things which have not yet passed, according to Isaiah. God alone is beyond time, and he has revealed some things to us. He's revealed some of his knowledge to us in his word. You see, it's only because of the biblical God 
the God who in Genesis 8.22 promised us uniformity. It's only because of the biblical God who's beyond time and has told us that the future will be like the past that we can presume that the future will be like the past. That's the only way you can do it. An evolutionist has no reason, therefore, on his own worldview to presuppose that the future will be like the past. And again, I want to give you some of these responses that you might hear from evolutionists that say, oh, you know, you don't, no, 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 you don't need the Christian worldview to know that the future will be like the past. Because we all, we all use that principle. We, we presuppose that we can use past experience as a basis for what is likely to happen in the future. That is uniformity, the principle of uniformity. And some evolutionists will say, oh, no, you don't need that. I mean, everybody knows that. Everybody knows there's uniformity. And to which I might say, uh, yes, but that's not my question. This is the fallacy of irrelevant thesis for those of you that were in my logic class yesterday. Everybody knows is true, but it's irrelevant. My question is, why is there any uniformity? And for that matter, how do you know about it in an evolutionary worldview? How can you know that the future will be like the past? This is not an answer, is it? Not an answer at all. Well, the inherent properties of matter just cause it to behave in a uniform way. That was the response that uh, Gordon Stein gave in the famous Bonson Stein debate. He says, well, that's just the way nature is. Matter is such that it behaves in this uniform, consistent fashion. And of course, that's not an answer either. We don't really know what the inherent properties of matter are intrinsically. We, all we know is what, what our experiences of matter have been like. But really, what he's saying here is, well, you know, that's just the way it is. That's the way the universe is. But that's not an answer. I mean, if we're going to debate this way, I'll say, well, creation's true then, and that's just the way it is. I don't really need a reason, that's just the way it is. That's an arbitrary response, isn't it? That's not really an answer at all. But one of the most common answers you'll get when you ask an evolutionist, why is it on your worldview you think you can use past experience as a basis for what's likely to happen in the future? Why does the future reflect the past? He's gonna say, well, it always has. It always has. Now let's think about that for a minute, because first of all, if, you know, when you first hear that, you think, well, yeah, it, it always has in the past. But you see, that's irrelevant to the future unless you already knew that the future was like the past. So this, this answer actually commits the fallacy of circular reasoning, begging the question. It's a circular argument. And a lot of people miss that at first because we take it for granted that we can use past experience as a basis for what's likely to happen in the future. But when I'm asking, why is that? When you say, well, because it's always been that way and therefore always will be, you're assuming the very thing that you're trying to prove. You see, so that's, that's begging the question. And it takes a while for people to get that. But think about it like this. It would be absurd to apply this to some other things. I could say, well, I'm immortal. I'm never gonna die. Well, Dr. Lyle, what makes you think you're never gonna die? Well, I've never died before, right? <laughs> so I assume I never will. That wouldn't be logical, would it? Some things change with time. Now, why is it we think that laws of nature won't? To say, well, they, they've been that way in the past and therefore they will be in the future, is begging the question. It already pre it presupposes there's that uniformity. Let me, let me try and illustrate this uh, graphically just so you can, maybe, maybe this will help you get it because for some reason people have difficulty grasping this. What he's saying effectively is he's saying, I'm asking why is the future like the past? He's saying, well, in the past, the future was like the past. That is, past futures were like past pasts. And we know that because we can remember that. It's now all in our past, you see. He says, therefore, in the future, I expect the future will be like the past. But when he says, therefore, he's crossing that boundary that we don't have any right on our own authority to cross. He's assuming that the future is like the past in order to say, therefore. And so that's the fallacy of begging the question or circular reasoning. And it may interest you to know, I have a, uh, I th there's a secular textbook on logic that I use. And in the section on logical fallacies, on the, on the fallacy of begging the question, circular reasoning, the very example it uses is this example. People who think that they can use past experience uh, as a basis for what is likely to happen in the future to prove that they can use past experience as a basis for what is likely to happen in the future. And to be really philosophically vicious, which I enjoy doing from time to time, <laughs> I, I could actually say you can't even know what happened in the past without assuming uniformity. Oh, but Dr. Lyle, I remember the past. But you see, your memory presupposes that the laws of nature are constant over time because your memory works on chemical reactions. If chemistry and physics were changing, you couldn't trust your memory. So unless there's already been uniformity in the past, you have no reason to believe that you correctly remember there's been uniformity in the past. Something to think about. We can't, you see, we can't know anything apart from the biblical God. We can know nothing at all except in the Christian worldview where God has revealed himself to us. And that's just a further illustration of this. So again, the critic of creation has to stand on creation ground to argue against creation. The fact that he's able to make a case at all demonstrates that he is wrong.